Um, everyone here okay? Good. So thank you uh, for the invitation back. Uh, this is uh, easily my favorite, uh, it might be my favorite conference in Canada. Like it's, it's, uh, it's always consistently a fantastic time. The speakers yesterday were great. The presentations were amazing. Um, the talk about the ego market alone was worth the trip for sure. Um, so three main questions uh, are what I would like to cover today. What uh, new lawful access powers were given to uh, government investigators in 2015? Uh, to conduct uh, online investigations specifically. That's the first thing. Second thing was, how has the debate around surveillance uh, changed in Canada uh, in the past few years? It's, it's steadily ramped up for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, I'll cover that. And then, where are these policy issues and this public debate likely to be headed? You know, not just in the media, but within the technical community, within the security uh, establishment, etc. So that's what I'm hoping to get through quickly today, but I want to leave time to uh, hear questions and, and get your impressions. So I'm going to go fairly quickly now here once I get started. So first question, what powers do governments have uh, to investigate cybercrime? Let me gauge your comfort level, though, first, because we're going to be talking about a different kind of code today. We're going to be talking about the criminal code, not computer code. So who, I'm wondering, in this room, just show of hands, um, has been served with a 487-18 warrant? Anyone had to reply to one? Nobody. Okay, good. Now, are you all saying that because you were put under a gag order? <laughs> no, that was a trick question. You can't actually answer that. Uh, um, <laughs> Okay, but we, do, do you know um, what assistance orders are, like under the, under the criminal code? You know, the, you, as a company or a compliance officer or an IT person within a company, you are served with a warrant um, to do a, a search of data, uh, but uh, very oftentimes certain companies in particular, and this has been a big thing in the States, is the companies actually demand to be compelled to provide that assistance. So, these are some of the powers that, that we're going to be going through, uh, just very quickly. But in a nutshell, just so everyone is on the same page, how a, the warrant system, at least in Canada, basically works is the police suspect uh, that evidence of a crime is on you know, a server or held by a commercial body. So it could be a hotel, could be an ISP, could be um, an internet company, doesn't matter. Police believe that there is evidence of a crime in, in the corporate holdings of that organization. So then, typically what happens is the police or the government investigator then goes to their superior uh, for an authority to proceed with a warrant application. That superior typically then goes to check with the legal department of the, of the said organization. If it, everything looks to be in order, the policeman then applies to the court. Court looks at it. Justice uh, will ask questions if required. It will be tailored as needed or not. Police then present that order, once the court has authorized it, uh, to the company in, in question. The company will then check with its legal department. And then if all appears to be in order, usually there's a specialized unit within the company, the compliance staff will be tasked by their legal department to provide the data that the police have requested. Data goes over. Investigation proceeds. So that's basically, in a nutshell, how the warrant system works. Um, so, what happened in 2015 um, was three pieces of legislation uh, were passed in Canada. We're going to focus on the, the lawful access one, but there were two others as well. Um, there was a bill called the C51 uh, SCISA, which was the uh, Security of Canada Information Sharing Act which broadened the uh, ability of federal agencies to share information around threats amongst themselves. Um, now, within the definition of security of Canada under that act, uh, digital infrastructure was one of the many examples. So, information sharing for the purposes of cybersecurity was one of the uh, new topics new issues uh, and new files that 17 different security 
uh, tasked organizations in Ottawa were permitted to share information between them uh, under that law. But that's not the lawful access law. Uh, the lawful access law was uh, C-13. Uh, the, the working title was the Protecting Canadians from Online Crime Act. And it uh, put in place a whole series of new powers that the police uh, and other government authorities had been requesting for quite some time um, because they wanted to catch up with other states uh, who had already signed on to something called the Istanbul Treaty uh, Against Cybercrime, uh, which is a, a much older, like 2001, uh, information gathering instrument uh, that you know the United States, various EU states had had signed on. Uh, Canada was uh, was viewed as a laggard, uh, hadn't brought its criminal code powers up to date, and so that is what became the rationale for C13. Um, besides uh, a whole series of other things that were happening at the time. Okay, so what are the powers? So the first one that the, uh, the bill enacted, uh, that you hit first as you read through it, are, are preservation orders. So with um, a judicial authorization, with a, with a court order, uh, police can order any data held in Canada, stored in Canada, to be preserved for up to 90 days. Uh, and there's the, the, the particular sections of the criminal code uh, are there. For uh, 21 days, so for three weeks, uh, they don't need to go to a court at all. So a policeman at a desk can fill out a single-page form, and that form goes over in the way that I described to the compliance staff of any company, and they will preserve the data for uh, 21 days. If, if it was routine transmission data um, or dump logs or anything like that, that normally the company would just get rid of, they can't. They have to keep it. Now, the police don't get the data. It's simply preserved. So uh, business transactional data that would otherwise be purged is set aside. And then the idea being that uh, the police would then, within those 21 days, would have time to go to a, a court and get a warrant in the way that I described. The uh, some of the other powers that were passed um, were uh, communication uh, tracing, so an any anonymous uh, communication, like an anonymous text or email or uh, what have you. Uh, the police can, uh, at a, a relatively low threshold, uh, most of these are at reasonable grounds to suspect, and I'll, I'll come back to that distinction between reasonable grounds to suspect and reasonable grounds to believe uh, when we get to the end of this. But so they can do communication tracing uh, on uh, electronic devices. Um, they can order transmission data, so uh, they can get, you know, um, basically, um, this is sort of like the legal equivalent of like a trace route. Uh, they can pull down um, web logs uh, for up to, again, up to two months. They can uh, order location tracking uh, using uh, phone GPS, car GPS, um, or they can do you know, cellular pings if, if that's what's required. They can uh, order subscriber, not subscriber, account, basic account information on uh, financial data of any type, so PayPal, any kind of payment service. Um, they can uh, get the uh, names of account holders, what kind of account it is, um, if it's linked to uh, an email address or a physical address. They can do uh, warrant tracking, uh, sorry, a tracking warrant, uh, either to trace transactions, uh, so where, uh, say, a particular card is being used, uh, or uh, a vehicle, or they can, um, at a slightly higher threshold, uh, order a actual individual tracking device, which is basically a beacon. They uh, do an implant on a phone, um, or, or actually, uh, if, they can get it on uh, to a device. Uh, they can basically implant just about anything. Um, so again, these are all criminal code powers um, that uh, really have only been stood up in the last two years. Uh, last part on this section is who gets to use the powers. Uh, on previously, peace officers, i.e. policemen, um, were the primary uh, user of these these powers. And so peace officers are the, tr the obviously traditional um, policemen 
uh, badge, gun, uh, and basic, you know, uh, straight up law enforcement authority. Usually, I should add also accompanying uh, some civilian oversight. The Protecting Canadians from Online Crime Act two years ago changed on and broadened the definition of government investigators that could uh, get access to the powers that I have just described and added basically public officers as well. And this is a fairly significant distinction in so much as you are now talking about anyone, well, I uh, put the definition up there, you're basically anyone in government who is responsible for the enforcement or administration of any law. So what that technically means is we're, t we're talking no longer about uh, police officers, we're talking about folks like the Competition Bureau, uh, Canada Post, Health Canada, um, Canadian Revenue Agency. All of these uh, organizations have within them investigative units and all of those uh, various officials are now allowed to uh, use these powers for their investigation. So that's the basic overview of how the law changed in 2015. So how has all of this broken out in the media? Uh, because obviously in the past few years uh, with Snowden, uh, with the NSA stuff, now with uh, the Trump um, discussion around the Obama wiretapping and, and what have you, there's been a lot of, a, an enormous amount of debate around surveillance powers, how they're used, who authorizes them, how they're overseen, are they legitimate? So in Canada, um, this really kicked off, it, I mean, it's been quite some time, and we are extremely lucky uh, in Canada in that we have, I mean, a, a whole slew of extremely tech-savvy uh, reporters who, who truly get what is going on in this, in this domain, I mean, Justin Ling at Vice, uh, Colin Fries at The Globe, uh, Matt Bragg at CBC, um, I could go on, like Alex Petillier, Jordan Pearson. I mean, we've got like a dozen extremely good sort of tech privacy um, reporters who do consistently uh, awesome work. And, and like the courts, I think, are generally extremely good at probing how, not just the rationale for, for police powers, but how they're actually being used. And this is my first example. So one of the ways that the media debate has been framed is around obligations for transparency. I don't know, has anybody ever looked at a transparency report, like a TSP transparency report? Okay, awesome. So Google, Facebook, um, various other uh, big internet companies down in the States uh, started this up after Snowden as a way to kind of like, put the brakes on uh, public concern around how much, how much uh, user data was being handed over to governments. At, but at the same time, it wasn't just a, a, a public relations move, it was also a very legitimate uh, attempt, I think, to put more information in the public domain, particularly for the courts who are authorizing this surveillance about the scale of activity that was happening. And so this bled over into Canada. So in 2013, this is the, this is the um, transparency report that, to their credit, Rogers Communications published. So you can see there, um, you get a, a sense of the scale. Uh, I'm just going to come out here. You, oh, no, you can't really see it super well. But what it says is that, um, right there. So that's, this is the big number down. But so in a single year, Rogers uh, Communications, so one telecom company, received 174,000, 100, basically 175,000 requests from law enforcement. Um, now, a good half of those were basically just uh, subscriber data lookups. So who is behind such and such an email, who is behind such and such an IP address. Now, content. But, it, but you go to the next number down is, uh, and again, it's almost half of the total, is uh, Rogers got 74,000 warrants um, in a single year. So that's a, that's a pretty significant number. Um, and after Rogers published theirs, uh, you got TELUS, 
you got Allstream, um, a bunch of other Canadian companies started to do the same. And so for the first time, at least in the telecom sec uh, part of the, the, the telecom industry, we started to get a sort of a breakdown of how the, the police were uh, serving these companies with warrants. The next thing that the media has been awesome on, uh, I think, is, the, is unpacking the implications of the court cases. Because, interestingly, as these powers were going through um, Parliament, uh, the courts began to essentially pres prescribe new rules for police almost as fast as the parliaments were authorizing the powers. Now, what I mean by that is, Literally, as the legislation that I've just described was proceeding through uh, the Senate, the Supreme Court came out with a decision called Spencer, I don't know if everybody's heard, heard of this one, uh, that basically found, at least in the police context, uh, individuals actually have a right not simply to privacy, but they actually have a reasonable right to anonymity online. That, that police who at the time we're conducting an online investigation and who kind of went around the warrant procedures that I described uh, in their investigation simply had not sort of taken the reasonable steps they could have. Uh, the Supreme Court found that particularly egregious and found that, uh, this was in 2014, found that things like an IP address and an IP address lookup need to be conducted with a warrant. And so the media has been extremely good on, on not only unpacking the implications of those cases in Canada, but then uh, explaining, I think very rightly, that these aren't simply cases limited to police investigations, but they, they have broader implications on how, um, say, Customs Revenue does its investigations online, or CBSA does its investigations at the border. Uh, so that's another way that the, the media have very usefully framed the debate. The third is the, probably the most obvious uh, theme that's come up is surveillance. And Montreal has actually been sort of the epicenter for this part of the discussion because, of course, um, the provincial government has called a commission of inquiry um, just down the street uh, into how police conducted surveillance of journalists, many who work just down the street, um, and uh, the, how those warrants were authorized by the, you know, the department, the, the provincial uh, judicial uh, officers who also work just down the street. Um, so it, it's, it's actually a very tight-knit community. La Presse is there, CBC is there. Those were the two main targets of the surveillance. Uh, the you know, Ministry of Justice is right over there, so I think it all happened basically within like six square blocks of here. Um, so. Uh, so that was the, so. There's now a, a full-on uh, commission of inquiry uh, here uh, in Montreal, looking into these issues. Uh, there's also been an enormous number of stories in Ottawa um, about installation of uh, MC catchers around Parliament Hill. So that's another place: courts, newsrooms, um, legislatures. You can generally assume that these are are on being pretty carefully scrutinized. Uh, they, CBC reported just a couple of weeks ago that they found MC catchers that no one seems to want to take credit for uh, at, the, uh, at the Montreal airport. Um, so this is a, uh, it's, it's a not, like I said, we have a lot of journalists in Canada who cover this stuff and it is an increasingly uh, interesting area to watch. So that's part two. Part three, I guess it's the last part of the, the talk, is where this is all uh, likely to be headed. Um, the, uh, I think there's two obvious predictions. Uh, those are not even really predictions. I mean, you can see probably pretty clearly where the public debate and I think the technological debate is going to head. Um, I think the first one is, is that there's going to be a real call for companies to account in a significant and serious way uh, for the data that they are providing to government investigators. Uh, and here what I tried to do, I don't know if you can see, is I tried to took the, the, the top three companies that are re reporting um, surveillance requests and sort of map them out against one another. Now you can see since 
um, the Spencer case that I described about the, uh, the right to online anonymity, the number of non-warranted requests that these companies are receiving uh, has dropped fairly significantly. It hasn't completely leveled off. So there are still avenues by which police can go to a company like Atalas or Rogers and get data without a warrant, but there's, they're usually fairly prescribed either. Uh, they have some other authority, like it's not a criminal investigation, it's the enforcement of some other law that enables them specifically to seek data like that. And those you typically fall under the government letters that you, that you see listed out there. Um, or it's an emergency. Someone is in, you know, uh, is, is likely to be in peril and the police can make a case that the information uh, is too, ur it's too urgent to seek, go through all the, the steps of a warrant process and they need to be provided it instantly. But the upshot of the fact that we have these companies now reporting it, and this was an issue at the, uh, the, the Commission of Inquiry here in Quebec, uh, because none of the Quebec telcos provide these reports yet, um, it, it means that where the companies aren't reporting, there's a real lack of understanding both between the police, the government authorities, and the companies that are authorized, or the, the courts that are authorizing the surveillance, um, there's a like, lack of a feedback loop. And then that, I think, is going to be a serious problem that very likely the, the, the Commission of Inquiry here in Quebec is probably going to highlight that uh, there's sort of a corporate responsibility to produce um, a kind of ledger as to how uh, data is being handed over. So that's one, uh, that's just one prediction, I would say. And then, the, the, but the most urgent, I think, debate is going to swirl around how these laws were passed in the first place. I think, to be blunt, um, the powers were passed in a, at a particular point in time where the parliamentarians themselves were maybe not fully, fully appreciative of the scope and scale of the powers they were passing. The legislation, unfortunately, will not be reviewed for another three or four years, at least not in any kind of like statutory requirement kind of way. Uh, but I, if I was a betting guy, I would say that the, the new government will very likely uh, take a closer look at the legislation in the short term. Um, because I think that the, 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 some of the problems and some of the scandals in Ottawa, in Montreal, at the border, uh, where these, these powers are being used are starting to really cause sort of like a political headache for uh, the government. And I, I think they're gonna get more, uh, more and more concerned as time goes by. And they're going to wanna reexert their role just like the media and just like the courts have in pushing back at uh, these powers. And that is all that I have, actually. So I want to thank you for listening, and I would love to hear how you uh, feel about some of, these, uh, some of these issues. If anybody has a question or an yeah. observation.